But with that said, let's do this. I'm about to turn this on. Spoiler warning, you are being warned right now. I am going into full spoilers on this movie. Starting with this. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is a part one of two. And this movie ends with a part one. It has a cliffhanger ending. We find out that Miles Morales has been transported back to a universe that is not his own. Because as we find out earlier in the movie, he gets bitten by the spider from a different dimension. That spider that bites him is not supposed to uh, bite him. It comes through through the multiverse, through the machine used by uh, Kingpin. And so when he gets transported back, he is now in this universe where Jefferson Morales is dead where his uncle voiced by Mahershala Ali is back and where Miles Morales is the prowler. It's an incredible just plot twist that what's so brilliant about it is seeing it the second time. There's so many visual cues that you don't pick up on just the look of the world. It has a little bit more of a graffiti art style to it. When you enter this world uh, symbolizing more of the uncle Aaron influence uh, on Miles's life. Even the jacket color is different. When he puts on the jacket when he's about to talk to his mom, that's a different color. It's just so many of these small visual cues that when it happens, you totally realize it. And they set it up so well at the beginning of the film to lead to this just incredible twist. And I just found myself just like, oh my God, what, what is going to happen? What are they going to do? And I love the just miles facing off with miles and this film very much ends on Haley steinfeld's character of gwen stacy who i already hinted at was kind of the protagonist of this story and she very much is she gets the she gets a complete arc she has a first act a second act and the third act the first act follows her leaving her dad because she he finds out that she is spider-man spider uh spider gwen and second act is her running away from him, her realizing what she has done, what she is doing to Miles. Basically, everything that Spider-Man uh, 2099 has been preaching is to this degree BS. And now the third act is her coming to terms with her father, having this moment, and then realizing that what she shared with her father, that's all that Miles Morales has to do to save himself and save his father. And that maybe this idea of canon that these tragedies have to happen is not something that is necessarily true. So she assembles a team. And my God, when this scene comes on the screen, I was flabbergasted. This was tears, joyous, just feeling of just this this musical cue real quick. I'm going to play a little bit of this music again by Daniel uh, Pomberton. It's the score. The final score of the movie is uh, start a band. And let's just get to this last thing, which is a, it's a cue from the first part of this movie, the Across the Spider-Verse intro. We're getting this band back together and they're all coming in. And we now see everyone who's a part of this team. You have obviously Spider-Gwen. You have Peter B. Parker. You have uh, Spider-Punk 2099. Actually, I don't think he's in this scene, but it's pretty much implied that he is going to be one of the guys saving Spider-Man. This this visual effects that this movie they're doing this actually reminded very me this reminded me a lot of babylon last year where it's just so much just energy rushing through on top of the score and just these colors just just this kind of frenetic energy that i just so vibed with and you get all of them you get Haley steinfeld as gwen stacy you get karen suni who i alluded to uh earlier he's spider-man india you get uh obviously you get uh, the inclusion of Peter B. Parker. But you also see some of the other pe people that we didn't see as much. We see Penny Parker, who is seen briefly earlier in this movie. She's coming back. But that also means who are we going to get to see a little bit more of? We see Spider-Man Noir and Spider-Ham, voiced by Nicolas Cage and John Mulaney, respectively. And it's just this energy. And they don't have any lines, but you just feel it is the band coming back together to save Miles Morales in this universe. And they're all there. They're all standing. And it ends with Miles, we're coming to save you. Cuts to black, to be continued. 
I was just floored at this ending. I just wanted more. I wanted to experience this movie. I wanted to see Beyond the Spider-Verse then and now. I just so was in love with this ending and this energy that it hits you off. It hits you off on such a high note. And this works as a cliffhanger, one, because it is using the convention of comic books to be continued. It's very fundamental in comic book storytelling. They hit that convention very strongly in this movie that this feels like a comic book. If you notice, there are issues that keep appearing on the screen where it is showing almost like this is this chapter. This is this chapter. This is this chapter to be continued in the next issue. I loved how they used the formatting of comic books to this film's benefit. I just found it just so endearing. And this ending to be continued, just bam, snap. I was just left just wanting it. I wanted to see Beyond the Spider-Verse then. Just I, I just couldn't get enough of this world. And to end it with that, I was like, God, I can't believe I have to wait another year to see the conclusion of this story. But it just got me so excited. And for people who are making this argument, because I've seen this on some Reddit sites, I've seen this from some commentators where they are like, OK, but this movie really isn't a complete story and that it doesn't have a finale and makes it kind of weak. You're an idiot. I'm just so sorry. You're an idiot. And I'm sorry you cannot engage with the medium of film and storytelling to any great degree. But if that's what you think, I'm sorry. I just don't really care about your opinion or your thoughts on this movie, because one the conclusive nature of this story is Haley Steinfeld's Gwen Stacy character, who, again, has a beginning, middle, and end. Miles Morales' story is left to be open, and it is a storytelling choice to leave it on a part one and a to be continued. And I don't think that's a cop out by any means. So many great films have a part one to be continued feel to them. The Lord of the Rings, Dune. Uh, Back to the Future, Empire Strikes Back literally has a cliffhanger ending. And I think a cliffhanger ending can be used to pretty wonderful effects if done right. And I think this movie does it so right. I just loved how this film approaches itself and how it just is able to achieve something so great and so monumental in its ending where again i'm just left uh kind of floored by it and i'm just trying to pull up some of my notes i'm having some difficulty here we go what i loved about this cliffhanger ending and i think what some people are complaining about and i've seen it actually kind of compared to fast x recently which again spoiler alert for fast x i didn't know i'd be doing this on the podcast fast x ends on a cliffhanger literally a quite literal cliffhanger where Dom Toretto was literally flying off a cliff about to explode. And you know, Dom Toretto is going to be fine in the sequel. You know, none of these stakes that they set up. You're like, okay, it's about to get resolved in the first two minutes of it. What this film does is it doesn't rush its finale. They could have ended this film maybe, and they could have really rushed it. They could have saved Miles' dad. They could have stopped the spot, but it wouldn't have felt deserved. And it would have felt very hacked and rushed. Uh, this movie's already coming in at two hours and 20 minutes. And I, what I liked about the cliffhanger wasn't a cop-out because the stakes felt palpable. I felt the stakes. I didn't leave the movie thinking, is Miles about to die? Like, obviously he's not. But what I did feel is, how is Miles going to return home? How is he going to get out of the situation? How are they going to find him before Spider-Man 2099 happens? Are they going to be able to save Miles Morales' dad? Every character's danger feels real and very time-sensitive, and that just gave it so much just emotion and kinetic energy in it. And like I said, it also works because of the story arc to Gwen, and her are kind of lending a finality to this ending without compromising Miles' story and allowing the final hour to be f- a film and not cannon fodder. Because I think it could have been so easy for this film to just become cannon fodder. Uh, but it's never that. This is never a part one. Oh, wait till see what happens in part two in the sense that I'm like, oh, okay, I left with an incomplete movie. I did feel like this movie can be watched completed the same way I can watch Empire Strikes Back. Now, If this movie was to, if we had never gotten the part three, or I guess part two, I I would be like, okay, this isn't a conclusive ending. 
But it's the same argument I would make for Empire Strikes Back. If we never got Return of the Jedi, Empire Strikes Back would have a definitively terrible ending. And we don't think Empire Strikes Back has that bad ending because we've seen Return of the Jedi and we know what happens. At the time, I'm curious what the discourse on uh, Empire Strikes Back. And to be honest, I think the discourse has gone significantly stupider on film uh, analysis since the 1980s versus now. So I'm sure the discourse actually isn't as stupid and toxic as it is right now and just so not engaging with the art form. But here's the thing. Trust your story writers. Trust these guys. They've delivered now four great hours of Spider-Man filmmaking and storytelling that I trust them to make this choice. I don't understand the idea of like, oh, this is what the MCU is doing or this has no stakes. And I'm just like, no, because these are very two different storytellings. I saw someone compare this and they were talking about it and they're like, this is the Rick and Mortification of uh, comic books and Spider-Man and all this. And I'm so tired of this. And I just want a grounded Spider-Man movie uh, that is fully of it to the earth. And you're dealing with the relationships of these characters, blah, blah, blah. And you don't have to deal with this multiverse. And I'm just like, then watch the Raimi trilogy. Those films exist. And I'm glad that this film does something different. I'm glad that this film takes risks. And I'm also glad that this film is willing to do some of the hard uh, work. There is an ambition to this film. What I liked about it is the filmmakers never felt restrained in their storytelling. I love that they took this multiversal story, but also deconstructed this multiversal story, the faults and failures of multiversal, a multiversal storytelling. The aspect that I found most engaging when watching in this uh, film, and I couldn't really talk about it in my non-spoiler review, but what I really loved about this film is what I found so engaging was this idea of canon because the idea of canon is literally spoken aloud in this movie. And it's the whole point of Spider-Man 2099. There is this canon. There are these things that happen to Spider-Man. There are the good things like the falling in love with MJ, uh, the, the, the weddings, all that stuff, the friendships. And then there's the bad stuff. There's Captain Stacy's dying. There's the uncle Ben's with great power. It comes great responsibilities. There's the being broke, all that. And it's the ideas of these are the fundamental things that make Spider-Man who Spider-Man is. And Miles Morales is not that because he is not Spider-Man because he can't go through certain things. Of this. He is this anomaly as Spider-Man 2099 keeps referring to him. And what I found so engaging about the storytelling is it is reflecting on that. And it is saying these are the constraints and restraints of telling a story that must hit all the beats and tropes that are deemed canon. And this film really spends the time exploring that. And just how much less interesting the story can be if we just know that Miles Morales' dad has to die. If we just accept that to be what it has to be and there's no change, there can be nothing different to that because then it is not the true Spider-Man story. What these creators in Spider-Verse across the Spider-Verse are doing, they are saying like, no, let's not accept that. Let's accept that there is something different, that there is something different, that we can do something challenging and creative with this to make something new and it is both a love letter to spider-man and all the spider-man movies because i really do feel like the filmmakers have a reverence and respect to all of the spider-man movies characters you can see it they have references to toby mcguire they have visual cues to andrew garfield they show tom holland some love in this movie they even show guys like venom love uh the tom hardy venom movies it is showing it is a love letter to spider-man in the culture that he exists in in the context of the comics of the tv shows of our history of spider-man in media uh it has visual cues from steve gitko in the 60s it has uh just all these different todd mcfarlane just all these guys kind of coming in line and it it is referencing it's very self-referential in its understanding it is both commentating on art and how you know comic book inspires andy warhol and the pop minimalist movement and then how that then inspires that generation of comic books and how that then inspires Raimi to make spider-man and then how that uh, visual language of filmmaking for comic books is then used in the marvel cinematic universe and then how that marvel cinematic universe dictates the video games and how the video games are influenced by the TV show and the TV shows influence the movies and Tom Holland is inspired by all of this. And this first into the spider versus commentary on all of that in a visual representation of all these movies, but then it's even slinging a bigger web on and on. And it's just like now across the spider versus commentating on into the spider verse, 
all these other movies that are in Spider-Man, all of this sings. It is all in harmony in the sense that this is all communicating with each other. It is all the history of Spider-Man coming alive. And to understand this movie, you have to understand all of this if you are creating it. But to enjoy this movie, you can just watch it and just kind of be impressed by it. There's so much just greatness of this movie and this idea of the canon. Uh, I love that it is both exploring this internally within the context of the story and just also saying, like, listen, like maybe the Marvel Cinematic Universe, just this idea of like canon and like what has to happen in this multiversal storytelling here is like what can be great about it. And then the greatness is getting Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, Tom Holland all together on screen, getting that energy and having that fun. But there's also downsides to that. There is also the struggles of we have to hit the cannon. We have to do this. And it is the context of not just Spider-Man in the MCU, Spider-Man as a whole, but also just modern day filmmaking and storytelling. So it is both a love letter to Spider-Man, but it's also an acknowledgement of the issues inherent to telling in Spider-Man story and the difficulties of that. And I love that this film is so self-aware of that. I love that this film is actually trying to engage with its topic and medium in a really interesting way. It is an art piece in the sense that it is commentating on the times of film. And it's just, just a love letter to all types of film. You really do feel just the inspiration that they have on it. As much as I've just talked about how this is influenced by the language of Spider-Man, pop minimalist, Andy Warhol, all these just Sam Raimi, Mark Webb, Tom Holland, all these guys. It's also influenced by animation, animation style, artwork, art throughout the centuries. You see this vulture character that is uh, called uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And it's just all this kind of coming together. And you see then how like this art style evolves, how this Spider-Man evolved, all of this stuff. And again, it's such a great communication with it that it's just so rich. You can watch this movie and just look at the background details and everything has a certain life to it, a certain gravity to it. And I love that. But it is also saying like, hey, at the end of the day, if we are confined to believe the restraints of Spider-Man, this film can't be interesting in confiding ourselves in like in putting ourselves in a box we are inherently telling a weaker story and that's what we don't want to do we want to tell our own story so it is very meta in that nature and what i also appreciated seeing this film a second time was the infinite amount of details just watching this movie for a second time i found myself engrossed by the use of colors i already kind of alluded to this in my non-spoiler review but how the colors and styles are used to express each individual character. At the end of the film, they do this amazing trick with Gwen Stacy and her dad, Captain Stacy, where the colors are walled off. You see, like, Stacy, uh, sorry, Gwen Stacy has her own colors. Captain Stacy has her own colors. And when the father finally accepts her for who she is, these two colors end up blending, blending together. And conceptually, that's such an easy idea. We'd all think that we're like, oh, yeah, that's what it should do. And it seems so simple to do it, but to do it without drawing attention to it and just allowing it to exist, to create atmosphere and to dictate storytelling cues was something that I was watching. I was just dumbfounded me. I'm like, oh, my God, that's such an easy visual language that no filmmakers really get to do. No one's can really do it quite like these guys making these Spider-Verse movies can do. I was just so impressed in just everything about it there were so many times watching this movie where i just wanted to pause the screen and just capture all the details because it is an art piece it is a masterful art piece come to life you could pause any of these frames put them in any museum and there's so much life vibrance just to this and so much storytelling this is art at its most profound at its most true at its most provocative and I loved it for this. The colors of this film are a story and they are a character within this film. Everything has life and meaning. And to do this, to blend all these animation styles, to just see it all come to fruition, I was just left aghast and by the beauty. I just can't even comprehend how incredible this film is. Across the Spider-Verse is just masterful. Oh, my God. Just so beautiful. And I, I've i kind of given some of my big spoiler thoughts on this movie. Uh, let's just talk about the spot real quick, because the spot has this 
Uh, really great story connecting. He's the guy that is hit by the bagel in the first Into the Spider-Verse, which is a funny callback. But what Jason Schwartzman does so well in this movie is the menace. You feel really his growing just anxieties and evilness. And by the end of it, he's a very scary villain. As is Oscar Isaac as Spider-Man 2099. He really is the antagonist of this story through and through. And they explore Spider-Man 2099's past. And in this past, do you see that basically the version of him in this other universe dies, so he goes to replace it and to be that version, Spider-Man 2099, but it ends up kind of destroying the universe. Uh, if you want an easy comparison, if you watched uh, the first season of, what's that Marvel, What If, What If?, there's that episode where Doctor Strange messes with the multiverse and it collapses in on that self. That is essentially what happens to Spider-Man Noir in this film. Uh, in this universe, he basically just destroys this universe and kills his daughter and everyone on it. And it's this pretty heartfelt scene and it's just this pretty tragic story. Uh, and you get all these moments and it's just like what I loved about the Spider-Man Noir storyline is again, Oscar Isaac. Oscar Isaac is a scene stealer in this movie and again his ideas really do talk about this canon idea that i just had this all really works again this mom dynamic that uh, miles morales has in this movie i just found exceptional there's this scene where they are talking on the rooftop that i just found absolutely beautiful just oh my god this this dialogue this to protect the child in yourself all of this i was just i was so moved by it there's a scene right before where Gwen and Miles are having this conversation and the camera just moves in such an interesting way. We kind of flip for a second and they're walking upside down and sideways. And it's just this just great visual filmmaking. It's such a fun way to use the medium and to use shot making uh, in this movie. Uh, one of the animation styles that I did want to touch on because I really got this... Uh, I'm trying to think of the author of the book, but it's Meows. Uh, it has this kind of visual language with the spot where you see the tragedy unfolding. And it's kind of just, again, I don't know if mouse is the correct term to use because I think there is a specific art style in place in this movie, but there is just this black and white imagery that feels a little scribbled. It feels actually Kurt Vonnegut. If you've ever read Slaughterhouse, uh, uh, what is Slaughter Slaughterhouse five? There's these little drawings that, uh, Vonnegut has throughout the books and when watching this movie I was like I was very much feeling that Vonnegut style along with this mouse style along with this kind of feels like Frank Miller to a degree all these kind of influences in on the spot you really get the tragedy of it and really tells the emptiness and longing of the spot story and this all just really worked for me again in wonderful ways and let's talk about some of the cameos in this film this film has a plethora of them so just off the top of the, my head some of the ones I saw, obviously, Spider-Man uh, from the video game is in there. Uh, Miles Morales' roommate is actually specifically he is playing uh, the Spider-Man PS5 video game. Uh, I saw Tom Holland's suit from uh, Avengers Infinity War. The Iron Spider is in there in the background when they're in the Spider Society. That was a visual cue that I noticed. Obviously, you have Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield there through archival footage in the canon scene where you're seeing all the things. I think Kirsten Dunst then is also in that scene. You get all the Uncle Ben's. Uh, I think you see briefly Tom Holland in that montage, but I'm not positive. I'm trying to think what are some of the other big ones that I saw visual uh, representation to. Of course, there's uh, Spider-Man from the TV show, Spider-Man Spectacular. The Japanese Spider-Man is in there to a really funny uh, effect. Peter Parked Car or whatever his name was, just really good comedy in there. I'm trying to think. There, One of my favorite things is that uh, the Spider-Mans, they actually use the iterations of Spider-Man. So at, at times you see Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, you see the Romero era. You see the Todd McFarlane suits. You just see all these other ones. So it's also kind of just saying like, oh, this is the language of Spider-Man storytelling and how Spider-Man has evolved and how he has shifted and looked throughout that. You have other ones who are different interpretations. Obviously, Scarlet Spider played by uh, Andy Samberg is used to really expert effects in this movie. I'm trying to think of some of the other Easter eggs that I noticed in this movie. Oh, obviously, you have the Doctor Strange just reference in this movie. Uh which is very uh, clear. 
Uh, thank you. Love your fam. Keep killing it. Spider Pig will be back. He is coming back. Obviously, that's a good one. That's an Easter egg. Not really an Easter egg, but Spider Ham and Spider no Spider Man Noir are in this film. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that are uh, just present throughout here. I know there's so many more. I saw there was a video where it's like 350 Spider Man uh, scenes. Uh, Easter eggs that you have to know about. I'm like 350. I was trying to catch so much. Uh, Lego Spider Man, voiced by Nick Novicki. Novicki. Uh, this is really fun. This one's one of my favorite because it uses the Daily Bugle set from a few years ago, a set that I have. True story. I accidentally dropped that set and it still needs to be reassembled, but it literally uses the Daily Bugle. That's a fun callback to uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller literally directing the Lego movies. Uh, that's something obviously I very much enjoy. I love those Lego movies. So to have that cue, JK Simmons is in this movie. Apparently in every multiverse, the one constant is that, uh, J Jonah Jameson is voiced by JK Simmons. Love that. Uh, trying to see who else is in here. I'm now pulling up some notes. Josh Keaton, who plays, uh, Spider-Man in the spectacular Spider-Man TV show is there. Yuri Lowenthal, Yuri Lowenthal. Uh, who voices Peter Parker in the Insomniacs games. He's very much present in there. You see, you see a few visual cues to uh, the Spider-Man uh, movie. Uh, trying to think of some of the other ones. Uh, I'm just reading off a few of the top of my head, or not off the top of my head, just through a few through this list. Oh, yeah, you obviously see Spider-Man from Spider-Man Unlimited Run, uh, Marvel Mangaverse. Uh, let's see, Spider-Woman's obviously in there, earth X. Oh my gosh, Spider Monkey, Spider Wolf, Peter Parkcar. That was one of my favorite ones that I already mentioned. Uh, the Mayday characters. Uh, well, this one was a fun one. I didn't know this. Uh, Jack Quaid uh, from The Boys. Uh, Huey from The Boys voices Peter Parker uh, in Gwen Stacy's universe. Let's see what else I'm missing. Oh my god, how am I forgetting some of these? Peggy Lou reprises her role as the convenience store owner from the Venom movies. This one was an absolutely fun one that I had a lot of. I think like that this was an acknowledgement of it without being a true just what's it called? Having to shoehorn Tom Hardy or God forbid Jared Leto in this movie. I think there's a Jared Leto Morbius joke in the background that I want to re-see. I think it's somewhere in the uh when you first get to the spider society, I think you see a Morbius that is supposed to look like Jared Leto. And I think it has like a funny, like almost like making fun of that Morbius movie. Uh, I have to rewatch that again to confirm that. Uh, but that one I really liked. Uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah. Alfred Molina. Uh, hello, Peter. There's uh, again, it kind of looks like they are implying that Alfred Molina there's versions. There's so many like fun jokes in there. The fact that it's a literal rhino instead of the rhino. Uh, that one's really fun. But let's talk about probably the biggest cameo, which I was just I was thrilled with Donald Glover, who portrays Aaron Davis in Spider-Man Homecoming, is in this movie as the Prowler. He is caught apparently by Gwen Stacy and Punk Spider-Man. This is such a fun one because what I loved about this one is, of course, Donald Glover has this really like, you know, history with Miles Morales. Basically, for those who don't not know this, I'm going to try explaining it as best as I can. Uh, back when it was announced that Spider-Man 4 was not happening, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 was not happening, and they were going to reboot Spider-Man, there was this fan internet, like, kind of, like, rallying cry. This was kind of the first, like, internet, like, rallying cry uh, that they wanted to get Donald Glover to play Spider-Man in a live-action film. It gets so much that in the community TV show in the opening of season three, you see uh, Donald Glover, he's wearing a Spider-Man pajamas, kind of a hinting at the fact of like this this growing fan base wanting him to play it. Obviously, it doesn't happen. They choose Andrew Garfield. But then when it comes time to make this new Spider-Man in the comics, Miles Morales, they do base it on some of the personality uh, of Childish Gambino slash Donald Glover, I should specifically mean. And then, of course, when Childish Gambino starts making his own raps, which, again, if you don't know who Childish Gambino is, he is Donald Glover. He's a pseudonym for uh, Donald Glover in his rap career. He's singing lyrics like he's that he's talking directly about Spider-Man. Uh, he eventually gets the cho uh, chance to voice uh, Miles Morales in an animated show years later. But, of course, when he gets cast in as Spider-Man Homecoming as Aaron, uh, the uncle of Miles Morales, this is a nice little nod to the Miles Morales storyline, kind of a full circle moment where, yes, now he's too old to play Miles Morales, but now you have this moment where it's kind of just honoring the history of Miles Morales, how much Miles Morales' story is inspired by Donald Glover, how much Donald Glover seemingly has a love for the character of Spider-Man. 
And of course, we never really get it much of Donald Glover. In fact, we don't get any of Donald Glover in the MCU post Spider-Man homecoming this movie, you see him in the Prowler costume. It's a fun little Easter egg. It's kind of this full circle moment. I loved it. Love, love, love this cameo. It's again, a cameo that doesn't dist- it's very noticeable, but it didn't distract to the actual story and telly. And it wasn't like, Oh, this is the moment you see this movie for. It's one of a million moments in this movie. Uh, but that is really largely some of my just big spoiler thoughts on this movie. I think this movie is going to do exceptionally well at the box office. Uh, it's already grossed uh, 90, uh, 70 million opening weekend. I think it's projected to hit 120 plus domestic. This film's going to be big. I really hope to see this film get a billion. I really want to see more movies like this.